we have got Tad on the line too. So yeah, what's up, Tad? Feel free to um, hop in here if you have questions and want to want to join. I'm gonna make sure you can unmute yourself. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so well, hello everybody. My name is Stephen Bailey. Uh, this is week two of uh, coffee conversations, not commute. I actually don't have any coffee tonight, but uh, you know, the idea, is, it's about the idea. So I'm joined with Scott Burns, uh, who's principal engineer at, at Stratasan and a former colleague of mine uh, at Vanderbilt. Scott, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, I'm Scott. I uh, work with Stephen, I guess, like a year or so. Do we overlap? Yeah. Yeah. So I was um, I was kind of building uh, like data pipelines at Vanderbilt uh, and Stephen was uh, working in the lab. We like uh, kind of worked in the same lab. Um, I was kind of getting on this big kick about reproducibility in science and um, uh, kind of helped introduce Stephen to, uh, I guess, coding beyond just uh, MATLAB and stuff like that. Um, uh, we were kind of getting big into Jupyter Notebooks at the time, which at the time I think was still IPython. Um, they hadn't kind of like made the switch. Um, uh, and yeah, that was, uh, yeah. was confusing like six months for me. Where it's like, <laughs> this is IPython Notebooks and then like all of a sudden it's Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, Yeah, they did that pretty quickly too. Um, uh, so yeah, I was like, at the time I was thinking a lot about like reproducibility in science. Um, I, I essentially, I mostly found that I cared a lot more about making science than actually like doing science. Uh, so when it came time to like write uh, a paper, you know, the actual output of science, I um, uh, I could like, you know, write up the methods, I could write up the analyses pretty well. I just didn't care about the rest of it. Uh, and that, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna make for a good science career. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, I decided to like leave uh, academia and uh, kind of pursued a, uh, an engineering role in the industry. Um, Stratus Sands like a healthcare analytics company. Uh, so we don't deal with uh, like patient data per se. Uh, we deal with like kind of post discharge um, stuff. Um, so it's usually like um, sometimes it's claims, sometimes it's counters. Those are kind of subtly different. Uh, but we help um, uh, hospitals and hospital systems kind of understand how they are performing in their market, how they want to grow strategically um, with all of the data that they are privy to uh, and kind of most healthcare systems uh, have no actual idea about how to make it useful. Um, yeah. So we kind of help them. Um, I think I've been there, I guess, probably about five and a half, six years, give or take. Um, yeah. And um, I've done a little bit of everything. Um, I uh, kind of started as a as a senior engineer um, of, on a team of like two, um, and the team is now like ten, I would say. Um, so I've worn a lot of hats, um, uh, everything from kind of you know just senior IC work, um, leading projects and products, um, and uh, leading people. Um, kind of did a stint of that for about three years. Um, which is, I think, a good thing to do. Um, and Charity Majors, uh, who's Mipsy Tipsy on, on Twitter, um, uh, has written a blog post and a couple of different blog posts about like the engineering uh, ladder and kind of making the hop between being an individual contributor and, uh, and management, kind of going back and forth. Um, so I am like on the other, I'm kind of swinging back to individual contributor for the time being. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think I'm still a leader in the company, um, but I'm focusing more on like kind of technical leadership. Uh, and so kind of um, uh, it could be uh, kind of proof of concepting G's, um, determining like sort of like better workflow practices for us, better CIC practices, um, all kind of doing the stuff that like raises kind of the tide. So all boats can raise and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, I don't really believe in like 10x um, developers. I think it's mostly a myth, but I think there is like work that can have sort of like greater than one X returns um, as far as like the time you spend. So I'm trying to find that um, whether it's kind of like building better documentation practices or, um, or, you know, tight, ultimately like tightening like the, the feedback loops of uh, are we kind of making the thing we want to make and are we doing it like in the best way we can. 
That's interesting. So, um, you know, in terms of what motivates you, you know, one of the things I went through kind of a similar process during, during my PhD, where it was like, okay, you know, I find that I just actually enjoy the methods and like building reproducible, um, you know, outcomes more than interpreting and like applying it to policy or like, you know, some model of, of the world. But how does that translate in your experience to like what motivates you in your, in your current role in industry? Yeah, I think uh, I think a research lab is a lot like a small company. Um, the principal investigator is is the CEO, right? They're kind of determining strategy and uh, fundraising, right? They're writing grants, um, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. Um, uh, and so, you know, the you know the grad students and the research team that is actually producing product, if you will, are are, are kind of closer to the actual methods and, and making stuff happen um, as a uh, kind of like in industry, we tend to have like a product team that's kind of determining what we're going to do. Um, and, you know, it, it becomes our job to figure out like how to do it um, like long term. Uh, how, how are we going to be able to maintain this? How are we going to be able to like tell other people how to use our software? Um, uh, anything you write in academia is probably not going to be used by anybody else. Um, just like <laughs> kind of. Um, as a general statement, uh, there are definitely like, you know, the, the methods groups out there, um, uh, in, you know, a couple of different labs, um, uh, that are, you know, less focused on like kind of discovering new things and more kind of building methods. Right. Um, so, you, so, you know, their software is used, um, you know, but you and I shared a lab where we were kind of like looking at, at interesting populations with semi-standard methods. Um, and so, uh, we were writing tools that only like our lab would use. Um, uh, but in industry, you know, the goal is that you're writing stuff that other people actually use. And so, you know, you, how like the, the, the mental model of how everything is working uh, has to like transcend beyond just like whatever's in your head or whatever's in your team's head. Um, so it's a lot more, um, I've, I've kind of come to understand it's a lot more than just like the, the stuff we write. Um, uh, there are a lot of like parts to the puzzle um, and engineering and, and data is just like one aspect. Um, uh, it would be really hard to build a company of just engineers and have no salespeople um, as much as like the two sides clash and you know sales always wants something that you're just not ready to build or don't want to build right. Um, they ultimately like gather the money that goes to your paychecks um, and so uh, sales would have a hard time like finding people to talk to if it wasn't for marketing um, and if marketing can't kind of like build a coherent message as to like what y'all actually do things can get difficult um, mm -hmm. product you know has like ultimately well, I think the hardest job of kind of like tying and, and hurting all of these cats together um, uh, to you know determine like if we built something is it actually going to be useful in the market are we going to do we are we actually going to like make our money back um, uh, how do we support it afterwards? Um, uh, and so, you know, a lot of like the human decisions. Um, and so, um, I, I, I think there's a lot of, um, analogies to be made. Um, but it really takes a lot of like different kinds of thinking. Um, yeah. And what's it take? Um, so where do you even start from the product perspective? Like where, you know, what, what dictates how you how you make your first or second move how you make these these tough decisions like is it yeah um we talk about the tall and skinnies a lot um and so if you if you think about on the x-axis um uh cost which could be in generally it's like time in our industry we don't really have we don't really pay for like capital goods at this point mm -hmm. we kind of do with like our cloud services but kind of not um uh so if cost is on the x-axis and value is on the uh, y axis, then we really kind of want to focus on like um, finding the highest value things we can do for the lowest cost. Um, and so when we have this kind of like big idea of a product, um, uh, we try and chop it up into like kind of like the most like atomic units. Um, and we give them approximate like value and costs. Um, and then we kind of we try to sort like everything um, by, you know, tall and skinny. Uh, so we want to do like the most valuable things first that are the cheapest things to do and just see if, if, you know, if it works, if there's any kind of like, um, uh, if there's any kind of value there. Um, 
theoretically, if you kind of break your product down into these, into this mantra, you have this like curve that does something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, which I don't, who knows if that's going to be backwards or what. But the thinking is that, you know, come time to like either release it, um, uh, you have theoretically built like the, uh, you have built up value in like the, the best way. Um, if you kind of do like the, uh, the opposite way of, of kind of like investing in a lot of like invisible value early on and the business says, okay, we got to ship whatever you got. Well, you know, uh, we haven't actually done anything the user can see yet. Right. right. And so um, we kind of take this, this mantra to like um, as our way of like experimenting. Um, uh, if you do really cheap things that could be super valuable um, and they don't work out, eh, it's fine. Like you haven't spent a lot of time on it. Um, if they end up being super valuable, then it gives uh, it gives you and the product team like kind of a an argument to say to the business like still haven't spent a lot of money on this, but we're seeing like some interesting value. Can we keep going in this experiment? Mm -hmm. um, because none of us know how things are actually going to like um, be received in the market. Um, none of us know if there's going to be a pandemic that like kind of alters the shape of the economy for an unknown amount of months. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we want to find kind of the, the most, uh, hope the, the most successful things that we can build as quick as possible and get some feedback, whether that's from like internal, um, like analysts or, um, some kind of like friendly clients that are, um, that are usually that are, that are interested to see kind of like, you know, what are we, what are we doing experimentally? Um, uh, feedback, um, is kind of the, the, the most important thing we can get um, because whatever ideas we have about um, how something should work or look or feel, um, uh, it could be totally wrong. Um, now to kind of like close that loop, what we, what you should do as you get feedback is like try and like tweak your mental model of, of how you think the customer is going to like um, how they think about your stuff. Um, if you don't do that, if you continue to like just get feedback uh, make changes and not incorporate that feedback into sort of like your long term. How do we like understand our market? Then um, uh, you're gonna. I, I feel like you're gonna kind of reach this plateau of like you know we can't kind of get better on our own. We're kind of beholden to like external feedback. Um, and external feedback can be good. It can be bad too because um, uh, usually the, the reason that that people tend to like especially i've, I've found in like um SaaS applications people don't want to like implement the work you do right and so um because it's maybe it's hard um or or, or maybe they don't have the capabilities or ultimately they've just found like it's not where they want to spend their money right um and so uh because they are not doing it they are not privy to kind of like the very like in-depth decisions that you kind of have to make. Right. And right. so sometimes um, external feedback is going to like not take that into account. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't say that like, you know, it's the only thing you listen to, um, but you have to kind of square it with like your general understanding of, of what you're trying to build. Um, I don't think anybody could have ultimately like uh, suggested um, the iPhone to Steve Jobs, right? Like nobody is going to say that. Um, it's, there are like, um, uh, there are things that if you're a solid, like product company, you have to kind of be able to like find your ideas and execute them on, execute on them internally. Um, but not be, be afraid to sort of like take cues from, from outside people. Yeah, that's, it's interesting that you talk about that because it's, there's a tension between innovating and, um, and getting feedback, uh, from the customer, but then also like being able to incorporate, to to check your expectations. Like you don't mm -hmm. know, you, you have to release it externally to, and get people on board and get real feedback within a customer environment. Cause you just don't know uh, what, what other businesses look like and how they use, they're going to use your product. But right. Um, so how do you kind of, I don't know, we dog food it internally or like, how do you iterate on this, um, you know, mental model of the market without having, you know, maybe access to the market or, or an investment from the market? early on. Yeah, we're, we're a little bit lucky in that um, we also, um, uh, I mean, there's, there's a couple of parts of our company, but um, kind of two, two interesting parts are like the engineering team and like our business analyst team. And so what we mostly task 
those analysts were doing is building like projects and custom work for clients um, that our software can't do yet. Um, and so what we can do is say like, well, what, what are our like analysts doing a lot of um, that they basically can like have either like templated themselves or, um, or, or doesn't require a ton of customization um, as we, and, and that we're doing a lot of those become like prime candidates to like build into software. Um, and so we kind of, uh, I guess we were kind of using them as a kind of an early like prototype stage. Um, uh, we don't nearly make as much money off of like one-off projects as we do as like software subscriptions. Um, but it's a really cheap way for customers to like get in the door, um, see how we do things. Um, and, uh, and you know, we can like kind of, um, uh, like pay for products, pay for at least like the develop, the kind of front end development of them, yeah. as far as like what should this should do, what are we, you know, where are we like grabbing data from, um, how do we present it, all of that stuff. Um, we can kind of um, at least, you know, to some percentage, um, like bootstrap an idea and see if it's, uh, if people are willing to pay for it, right? Yeah. Um, and if we can then kind of productize it in software, um, it's not so much that we're going to like take those people off the job. We're going to let them do higher level stuff right. um, and sort yep. of like um, kind of continually invest in them um, to figure out stuff that we just don't know how to do in software yet or, um, uh, or don't want to kind of like invest in the all, all the customization that's required um, until we kind of like, you know, use their knowledge to land on like what is the 80% of a functionality that we can hit right so what's that relationship like between the uh the product and the analytics team is it um it, you know obviously it's a little symbiotic and that you, they're giving information to the product team and then and also all, like almost prototyping solutions um mm -hmm. but what kind of what kind of channels you know do they communicate on is it like some is it like are there priority is it a priority board that the analytics team has that they're like adding feature ideas to or um uh yeah this is this is one of the i think one of the hard parts um uh that product has is like kind of finding some communication channel that every team can like contribute to um i'm not sure if we've like successfully done it yet um but we have moved over um like an analyst who has who has kind of done everything um she's now like working in the product team um i think her title is still something innovation um but i think the maybe the the easiest thing to do is just like move people around um you know get like the domain experts on um, into a team that um that can like use them um and and help those domain experts also kind of learn the like productization life cycle um uh because they're both like necessary um and when you kind of, I feel like anytime you can, you can help a person like understand another aspect of the business, you are kind of that much closer to, you know, helping them achieve like unicorn status, right? Mm -hmm. um, engineers uh, that can like work across the stack are very valuable. Product people that can work um, across the, you know, their stack um, with regards to like mockups and, uh, and user flows and user stories and building acceptance criteria through like user interviews and um and if you and if they can actually get domain expertise um then they can like uh that's like kind of one that's a that's a faster way they can iterate over the loop of like is this going to be a good idea well i actually like know it's going to be a dumb idea because i have a lot of domain expertise right it's like one fewer um, um either asynchronous step or a meeting to have it's one less of those things um yeah. it's it's that much easier to make a decision so I think the the more we can kind of um, uh, mix and match people, um, uh, the the better to kind of like cross pollinate uh, not only our ideas but like ultimately like the tasks that need to get done. I think the better. Hmm. That's interesting. What have you? Um, what what prompted your swing back to individual contributor from uh, from manager, people person? Yeah, I, well, I, I was never not an individual contributor. Um, at a small company, um, you, you tend to do uh, a lot of the things. And so I was um, kind of doing both uh, people management and uh, kind of thinking about like, 
uh, the you know hard the hard kind of um, architectural stuff. Uh, those are like really at odds with one another. The kind of thinking you have to do um, uh, as a kind of a senior IC, you need to be able to like focus for long periods. Um, and uh, as a manager, you need to have like slack in your schedule. Um, uh, or free time, I guess, um, not to like confuse words, uh, to be able to say like, you know, when somebody comes to you and says like, I'm having a bad day, like, okay, let's take an hour and go for a walk and, and talk it out. Um, or to after a meeting to be able to say like, you know, Hey, can I give you some feedback about, you know, what you said in there? Um, you just kind of have to have that built into your schedule. Um, and so, uh, those two are, are like, it, it can be really hard to feel effective at both when you're trying to do both. Um, I also ultimately, um, uh, I think I ultimately didn't find like the ways to to kind of create the same happy brain chemicals as I did from people management as I did with um, uh, kind of as a as an IC. Uh, you are as an IC, like it's it's really easy to see what you're doing on a day to day basis. Um, you know, you are um, uh, ultimately like landing new things, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's easy to see your your effect on things. Um, as a people manager, it's really hard to see your effect. Uh, you can't quantify like how well a one-on-one -on -one did because you could say like the exact same words in that one-on-one -on, -one on the next day and it could it could be like received totally differently because people are ever changing. Um, in that respect, computers are super straightforward um, because they are generally very deterministic systems uh, and people are, the least deterministic things um, that are on the planet. Um, and so um, I don't think I'm done with people management, but I think um, I think I need to take a break and um, kind of get back into uh, the swing of technical things a little bit. Um, uh, I think a lot of people would agree that a, um, a manager with like a technical background is going to be more effective than the ones without. Yeah. Um, because, uh, you know, the team is going to, um, ultimately be able to like get behind, uh, the manager's ideas a little bit more because they're coming from like a place of like, uh, of some expertise. Um, they're gonna, a manager should kind of pretty, pretty easily know, you know, you know, we're asking this, um, like mid-level engineer to do like staff level work like something's going to give here they, they might be able to like grow into the project they might not um uh whereas a you know a non-technical person uh, in a management role is going to have a little bit tougher time like understanding like you know th no this is an impossible task um uh um so i don't think it's um i don't really consider it like a, a downgrade or anything like that i think there's just um uh, there's, there's different value you can provide to a company, right. whether you're in management or, um, or in, as an IC, um, and, you know, and, and it's kind of the same cross pollination of ideas. Um, you know, having been a manager and going back to an IC, I have a lot more, I, I have a much better picture of like, how can I like make my boss happy and make my boss look good? Well, right. I was that boss. Right. And I knew what it, what, you know, things, what things, how, how good things could be. Um, and so, um, and on the flip side, you know, like I was just saying, like if you move from uh, an IC to a manager, you have a really good idea about like, you know, what these things take from a technical perspective and you can be right. kind of make that more, um, more better a decision. Um, uh, especially, you know, talking to like non-technical stakeholders um, as to, you know, why we can do something, why we can't do something you know, what, what are the kind of like the constraints involved? Yep. Yeah. That makes, that makes total sense. Um, Tad, did you have anything you wanted to, to ask Scott? Um, I, I don't know if you have time. I'm, I, I've got one or two more questions if you've, if you've got time, but. I'll yeah, wait. I can go for um, probably about five or 10 more minutes. Okay. Um, one of the things, you know, I, that I found really helpful in one of our previous chats was um you know, to this point about humans being totally non-deterministic, uh, you know, finding a management style or a team, like team practices that work in your company mm -hmm. can be a, take a bit of trial and error. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you approached that when you were managing and like, what, how do you build a, a set of practices that works 
uh, for your team? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think whatever you try, whatever practices you try, um, whatever changes you try and get into the organization, um, all of that is like predated on relationships and if people trust you um, and vice versa, if you trust your people. Um, but if people trust you, then you can initially uh, like miss or, or not be like totally correct on an idea. Um, and uh, people can like uh, look past that and say like, oh, I see why they're trying to do this. Um, uh, I, I trust that they have like our best, uh, our, our best um, intentions in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm actually gonna like help steer this in a better way, yeah. right? Because, you know, I see why they're trying to do this. Um, and, and, you know, I, I have like a, a very like trusting relationship. So rather than just like uh, shut down or like actively like lobby against some particular change, um, because of this like trust and this foundational trust, um, I'm gonna like help make it better. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, I think the thing, whatever you can do to like build trust, um, uh, that's, that's, that's one of the only things that we can kind of like build any higher level stuff on, uh, is trust. Um, and if there's not trust, um, you're not going to want to work with anybody and nobody's going to work with you. Um, when, when things get hard, when things are easy, then like everybody, right. Everybody's mostly, um, okay. Um, uh, and I, this is not my idea. Uh, I think uh, Pixar people have said this, that like success hides problems. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, so it's really like, the, it's the, it's when the hard times come that you have to like um, be able to, uh, I guess, like uh, spend the, the trust, you know, yep. credit that you've built up to be able to say like, I know this is hard right now, but um you know, we value each other as a human above all. And um, I want you to succeed. You want the company to succeed. And so let's do this hard thing together. And how do you build the trust? Um, you, uh, how do you build the trust? Um, I mean, so you, you focus, I think you focus on like um, exposing yourself as a human first and foremost, and like getting to know your humans as humans. Um, uh, a lot of my one-on-ones were spent like, um, uh, like going for walks and, and talking about like the person's family and, you know, how, how you know, how, how do they kind of, um, how do they approach life? Um, uh, I, towards the end of my one-on-ones, I would kind of get into like, um, you know, potential work things, but I felt that like kind of making a, a human connection was like kind of the easiest way to like build trust and, and to, to get to, to get to understand, like, how does this person make, like, make decisions? Um, yeah. what, what are, what are the, what are the things that, like, they are, what are their heuristics for, um, for understanding the world? How do they think about things? Um, hmm. and if, and on the flip side, if you kind of show them how you think about things, right, they're going to, to understand, like, and kind of better, um, model at least maybe within their head like you know how, how is if i do this thing how do i think scott's going to interpret it um is scott gonna like hate it or um you know if, if for example we we talk about like the importance of learning um and i tell scott like you know i want to take uh i'm gonna like kind of stop working on friday afternoons and sort of like focus on uh reading you know some kind of book or or buying like a class, uh, do you think he's going to take, he's going to like say yes to this? Like, of course he will. Right. Cause you've already like talked about like the, you know, what, what are important to each other. Right. Um, and so, um, the more you can kind of just get to know people on a, on a personal level. Um, I think the, the better shot you have at understanding how they make decisions and, um, you know, what, uh, what, what they will do in the face of adversity. Nice. I like that. Well, I think that's a really good place to end. Uh, cool. Know your, get to know your humans as humans. Uh, know your humans as humans. I like that. Um, well, cool. I'm going to stop recording, but.